I think that uh, the next thing we'll have a look at is some real microphone designs, uh, some yep. mine, some legacy designs. In order to do this, we'll probably want to have a look at phantom powering. Phantom powering of microphones has been used for ooh, 60 years or more, and it's a well-known technique for running power to a microphone down the same wires as you're uh, putting the audio back up. Now, let's do it. Eh. Over on this side, we have the uh, the mixer or the microphone preamp or whatever it is that's going to receive the microphone signal. Down over on this side, we have the microphone itself. And in between, we have a twisted pair. It's got to be twisted pair. Yes, with shield. With typically XLR connectors. Yes. Any okay. brand preferences? <laughs> Amphenol. <laughs> Amphenol. It's got to be Amphenol. Yep. Uh, okay. Why do we go to all of this effort of using twisted pair with screen instead mm -hmm. of just plain coax or even just twisted pair? Uh, well, first of all, the screen keeps out electrostatic noise. Electrostatic noise is any noise which is capacitively coupled from, say, a, a high voltage wire down here, a mains wire, into these conductors. So the screen keeps out the electrostatic stuff. Mm -hmm. The fact that they are balanced twisted pairs keeps out any of the uh, noise that can be coupled by magnetic fields, 50 hertz transformers, ad adjacent transformers, uh, current carrying conductors, that kind of thing. So typically what we've got over here in its simplest format might mm -hmm. be say a dynamic mi microphone, which is yep. a coil. Uh, and over here we've got effectively an instrumentation amplifier whose gain we vary. And that might wrap around there as a, uh, again, a Faraday shield, shield. an electrostatic yep. screen. And that's grounded over there so that any capacitive current that's induced into there has somewhere to drain to. Mm -hmm. That's a mistake that uh, some of the Americans tend to make in their 110 volt gear. They kind of actually forget to connect that ground to real ground, ground. Yep. as a result of which any mains leakage entering there makes the shell of the microphone effectively electrically hot. Go so on. grab hold of a microphone, grab hold of a grounded <laughs> microphone stand and see the shaking. <laughs> Part uh, of the act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the whole purpose of an instrumentation amplifier is that it will respond to differential variations in the mm -hmm. voltage between those two conductors. It's a differential amp. Yep, but it won't respond to common mode changes. Mm -hmm. That means that we can induce quite a lot of common mode noise on that, and it's completely ignored at the output over there. That's all fine and good while you're using a dynamic mic. Uh, all falls over when you want to use a circuit over here that draws some power. Mm -hmm. This is where we adopt phantom powering, whereby in its original incarnation, going back six, seven decades, however long, we would put a transformer in there. Mm -hmm. Instead of having our solid state differential amplifier, that would typically then go off to a valve stage center tap that, connect that via a resistor to a supply voltage. Over here, we'd have a transformer from which we could extract yep. a voltage. So between there and there, we've got a DC voltage mm -hmm. that powers the circuitry, which is in turn driving that transformer. <coughs> okay, the DC path because it's flowing through both halves of that transformer, gives a net zero magnetic uh, or magnetization of the core. So, uh, how do you put it? The, the core and this transformer are not being stressed by any DC magnetization. Same thing applies over there. Mm -hmm. The, uh, how do you put it? The standard P 
48 phantom powering, uses a 48 volt supply, a 3.3 K resistor, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which limits your, how do you put it, your short circuit current over here to something like about, I think it's 14, 16 milliamps, something about there. Mostly though, you might be using about eight or 10 milliamps consumption there. Mm -hmm. If you're pulling 10 milliamps here, well, that causes 33 volts drop across there. That 48 volts drops to about, uh, what, 15 volts. And so you're getting 15 volts at 10 milliamps there. Yep. That's enough to power a it fair is. bit of analog circuitry. Absolutely. May, plus maybe light up some idiot LEDs or something like that <laughs> if you really want to. Uh, a variant on that, if you don't like transformers and Let's face yeah. it, these days, who does? Because they're expensive and yep. they're bandwidth limited. And the only kinds of people who really like transformers are the ones who also like tubes. Okay, let's take that away. Instead of using a center, ta center tap transformer and a pair of 3K3 resistors, we'll feed each leg from something around about double that resistance. Yeah, if you want to round off, let's call it uh, 6K8 each from the 48, 48 volt supply. Mm -hmm. So far, so good. We're still feeding them balanced. Okay, we've loaded the line by a total of, well, what, 13K, yep. but yeah, big deal because we've generally got something with fairly low source and exactly. down there. Capacitor couple off that into our differential amplifier. Right. Beauty. That's what we do down that end. Okay, what do we do up here? Mm. We can do a few things. The easiest one is to pick up from both of those some DC mm -hmm. voltage, okay, which we can then come over and we can do things like uh, Xena regulate those with reference to that ground there and then use that voltage there to run our circuitry, which we then use to drive back into these fellas here, mm -hmm. capacitively coupled. <coughs> now, if you've got a balanced source over here, yep. then beauty, you don't have to go any further. Now, i.e. a differential driver. Yeah, and incidentally, an example of that might be a very simple FET circuit <coughs> consisting of resistor, JFET, and resistor. Any voltage that you put in there appears there mm -hmm. and in antiphase there. So you can quite happily couple those straight over to there. Nice. Not so nice because uh, the source impedance there is low. Yep. The source impedance there is equal to that resistor uh -huh. there. <coughs> so we okay. haven't maintained a balanced Balance. impedance right. and it makes the thing susceptible to noise. Got it. <coughs> One of the cleverest circuits I think was come up with by the company Shopes, microphone company, right. uh, S-C-H-O-E-P-S. I'm not certain of my facts here, but I think this is who came up with the circuit whereby <laughs> you get one of those and uh, now oh, this is going to be tricky to draw this is oh, going to be tricky on. to draw <laughs> uh, okay ground okay over here uh, basically what we're doing is feeding into the emitter of a PNP transistor and into the emitter of a PNP transistor mm -hmm. uh, those collectors go into the thing that forms our positive supply, which is actually used there. Those uh, bases there are... It's starting to look like a differential. Yeah. Yeah. Are biased down to the collectors with high value mm -hmm. resistors, typically about 100K. And we capacitor a couple of signals onto those bases. Yep. Oh, that's an elegant circuit diagram. <coughs> now, it's just a different, it's like a differential uh, front end on a op amp. It is rather. Uh, the only unusual features are the fact that mm -hmm. this Zena here yep. has kind of locked the it, collector yep. voltage, which in turn locks the base voltage at being uh -huh. maybe you know, half a volt higher, yep. depending on the bias currents 
flowing up here into those bases through those resistors. But it's, it's very close. Mm -hmm. The emitters are only about a volt and a bit away from the collectors yep. and fixes those at pretty much that voltage. Nice. Low output impedance because they're yes, emitter followers. Exactly. These resistors act as the load resistors for, for those, those emitters. Yep. It's it's elegant. It's, it it's is. nice. I like it. Yeah. Uh, and it is. Uh, is it still used? Uh, oh, half a Brazilian Chinese <laughs> studio uh, condenser microphones nice. can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they're all using this this kind of type, topology mostly. Yep. Uh, and it doesn't have a lot of downsides. Uh, one of the few downsides is that, uh, I'm just trying to think, if for some reason you get a short from one of those lines to ground, yeah. uh, ah yes, you've got enough uh, uh, capacitance there, that, and that's typically sitting at 15 volts, you've reverse avalanched those transistors ah. by shorting that to ground. <coughs> you can basically cure that by putting in a couple of uh, uh, reverse bias diodes there, Got if you're sensible enough to do so, and that fixes that problem. The other problem involves this phase splitter over the front mm -hmm. here, <coughs> which uh, on a good day, from there to there, you get a gain of about 0.7 or 0.8. It's not a particularly good follower. Mm -hmm. JFETs, yep. they're a follower, but they're not as solid as a bipolar. <coughs> so typically, uh, from there to there, it'll have a gain of about 0.7. Uh, and therefore, from there to there, it'll have a gain of about minus 0.7. Mm -hmm. Total gain from there to there, about 1.4, 1.5. Okay, so far, beauty, right. all good. The only problem is, uh, okay, you've got this very small source capacitance feeding that. I've run out of board space here. Oh. Ah, key thump. Okay, that's being fed by, yeah, maybe yep. 50 puff. Depending on the FET that you've selected there, it's going to have capacitance here, well. and it's going to have capacitance there. Typical order of magnitude, let, let, let's call that 50 puff. And let's call that about, uh, say, 10 puff. It's been a bit it's generous, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, no, of course, these, are yeah, usually, they, they, right. these aren't tiny, tiny fits. Right. These are yep. next level up in junction size, etc. Got it. Uh, reason? Because you're after fairly low noise. That might be 10 puff, and that might be, say, about 30 puff. Okay. Now, here's where Mr. Miller comes ah, into yes. the scene. Okay. From that point there to that point there, we said we had a gain of minus 0.7. Mm -hmm. So the total voltage from there to there, if you like, is 1.7 times the input voltage. That 10 puff looks like a about a 17 puff mm -hmm. cap down to there. On the other hand, that 30 puff cap, well, we've got uh, one unit of voltage there, 0.7 there, 0.3 across it, 0.3 times 30 is about nine puff. So basically our 50 puff uh, ca mm -hmm. capsule <coughs> is loaded by an additional 26 puff of capacitance. That's huge. Uh, it's fairly large. Well, 26 puff <coughs> against 50 puff, you're looking at probably 3 dB down, 3 yep. dB attenuation compared Easy. to the open circuit voltage there. So it's a bit of a downside. Uh, the other downsides are limited linearity. Not so much due to that, but due to the fact that these can only swing so much. Mm -hmm. Remember I was saying that they are only you know, a, a volt and a bit away from there? So it can only swing down so much, and that can only swing down Got so it. much. It can swing up as far as you feel yeah, like. Yeah. But yeah. So limited output headroom on that right. kind of circuit. But still, immensely successful, developed I think probably three, four decades ago. You know, back back yeah. in the dawn of semiconductors, almost. Yep. It's a bloody good circuit. Excellent. Okay, but let's improve that a little. Okay, we're still phantom powering over there. 
I'll right. just <laughs> redo my termination. And that is still a typical configuration used today. Absolutely. By everyone. Yep. yep. Everything from your little cheap uh, Mackie or Behringer right. yeah, mixes little, yep. through to your monsters. Right. <coughs> and through to uh, some of your multi-thousand dollar single channel studio uh -huh. preamps, they'll be doing that. Uh, once you go beyond your couple of thousand dollar into your ten thousand dollar plus stuff, you're probably looking at a transformer again because that's the wanker market that you're dealing exactly. for. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I'm going to get shot down in flames for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I'm going to hell! <laughs> We're all going to <laughs> <laughs> oh, now on that last so circuit, the Shope circuit, yeah. uh, I did point out the fact that the impedances there were both low mm -hmm. and balanced. Yes. Okay, so we get all that benefit yeah. of uh, noise rejection, common mode, no common, common mode noise rejection in the system. Did the transistor pair have to be matched over here? Uh, not to brilliantly, but yeah, 10 yeah. or 20% will do the right. job for you. No. It's mainly more about DC bias conditions yeah. than about anything else. Right. Okay, let's once and again. And thermally matched. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, not hugely, it helps. Right. But it's not a decider. Let's once again ex extract power off those with a couple of resistors, mm -hmm. whack that into a dirty great big electrolytic, etc. Absolutely. Whatever regulation you feel like. And again, we're coupling signal into those. Mm -hmm. The main criteria that we're after is to get the impedance on those two matched. Now, what happens if we've got, say, a lovely single-ended mic? Hang on. Hmm? What about the mismatch on the caps? The uh, on the caps? Yes, it does come into the scheme mm, of things. Yeah. You have to make those caps large enough yep. that uh, uh, over the frequency range of interest, exactly. and especially down to the magic 50 hertz mark, mm -hmm. that their contribution to, you know, let, let, let's just say that that's the impedance of those two or the, yeah, the, the overall system. Uh, over here you might be looking at system impedances of, well, say 6K8, say. Mm. You want that to be maintained down to well below 60 hertz before they decide to start Absolutely. going up at different breakpoints. Yep. So you want their, uh, you, you want their reactance to be low enough mm. at 50 hertz compared to the system reactance that a bit of mismatch there doesn't hurt and it only really takes effect down in the uh, sub hertz mm. yep. region. <laughs> nice and easy. So and you'd be typically looking at using electrolytics yes. for that. Hence why I said, because they're you know, going to mm. be plus minus 20% or something oh. like horrible, like plus yeah. 50. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if they're going to be plus minus 50%, yeah. just put them down at such a low frequency that plus that minus 50 matter. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yep. So you've come up with this circuit, you've got a lovely preamp there, ah, single-ended. Mm -hmm. What do you do? That's real easy. We've gotten as far as here, we've developed the world's brilliantest single-ended preamp. What yep. the hell do we do? Okay, how about we, I don't know. Well, why did you do, design it single-ended to begin with? Why didn't you do a diff amp, uh, a differential output? Basically because diff amps are going to be intrinsically always noisier than a good single-ended. Oh, there's another video. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Let's couple that on, onto there via a mm -hmm. resistor so that we yep. get a defined output impedance. This has typically got a near zero, zero. output yep. impedance, but mm -hmm. uh, just for the hell of it, we might give that, you know, maybe 50 ohms or 100 ohms or 200 ohms or something right. like that. And let's simply match that impedance mm -hmm. and connect it to ground. Yeah. And all of a sudden we've created a microphone which only uses a single-ended amplifier yeah. but still has completely balanced impedances so we get all the benefits of system noise reduction and system immunity from induced noise. I guess you do. Just with simplicity right. because we don't need a balanced topology amplifier anymore. Got it. Let's have a look at a balanced topology amplifier. Let's do it. 